So indeed, today I would like to talk about social autonomy and how we can guarantee that our autonomous systems and robots are socially acceptable. So in other words, how we can ensure correct by design social autonomy. So first of all, I would like to start with uh, an introduction of one of my observations. So now we see robots and autonomous systems of all kinds that are now appearing in our daily lives. So for instance, there are uh, these very complex autonomous cars that have to, uh, to plan trajectories, to take into account uh, the humans that may eventually cross the street and also uh, different driving styles they should adopt. Perhaps not too aggressive or not too defensive because uh, the autonomous cars is also an environment with other drivers next to the autonomous car and they also have uh, to have a good user experience as well as the, uh, the pedestrians in the, in the car's environment. So um, there are also robots that, uh, that have a direct interaction with humans. So here you have an example of a robot placed in a, in a retirement home, which uh, interacts with uh, senior people to make them exercise. So all these robots, they are not only complex because uh, of the technology they embed, but also regarding the complex tasks they have to achieve. So deploying such robots in, in social environments, it leads to, uh, to new research challenges, such as predicting human behavior in crowds, identifying uh, different navigation styles, or enhancing uh, human-robot interaction. So the goal is to enable robots to react efficiently and appropriately to uh, human behavior, and why not to mimic this human behavior in order to improve the perceived safety and also the trust in human-robot interaction? So the robots controllers are usually based on, uh, on algorithms uh, that take into account a lot of data about the sensors and the environment. And these controllers, they are trained based on examples. And then when they are put in real life situations, then uh, they can usually complete the tasks that have been designed to perform pretty well. Um, and one very powerful model uh, that is used to control uh, many aspects of the robots, not only the trajectory or how to avoid obstacles of people, but also the way to speak, nonverbal textures and so on, are the neural networks. So neural networks are really widely used, not only for robotics, but also in, uh, in applications uh, such as image recognition, for instance. So I as we know, there are really powerful models with, uh, with very uh, different applications, and they are powerful since uh, it's not rare to see deep neural networks with, uh, with great accuracies. But despite being very powerful, these neural networks, they are biases, black boxes. So of course, you always see what is the input to give, uh, you give to the neural network, and you'll see, you also see the, the output. But the way the decisions are made in the neural network, you have no clue about it. So in fact, you cannot debug the information and the decision making of the neural network which is one of the biggest pitfalls when it, it comes to, uh, to accountability of, of neural network driven models. So the problem also is that this training is the overfitting to the training examples. So that when you encounter slightly different situations that the ones uh, the neural network has been trained on, then you may end up with inaccurate predictions. So also neural networks, they are not always robust in terms of attacks. So there are these two famous examples of neural networks and their relative robustness uh, for image recognition. So sometimes a little noise may completely falsify the outcome that is provided by, uh, by the neural network. So for example, it has been shown that, that some noise on traffic signs, so for instance, this stop sign with stickers on it, they can interfere with uh, the good recognition. So in that case, it may end up being recognized as a, as a speed limit 80 sign instead. And that can be a big issue because if you embed these kind of models in autonomous cars, then, uh, then it might be uh, misleading uh, the behavior of the autonomous car. So the problem here is how can we provide guarantees, 
concerning the validity and the safety of human robot interaction models. And how can we build accountable and interpretable models for safety critical human robot interactions? How can we also improve uh, the trustworthiness of, of human robot interaction? So as opposed to uh, neural networks, formal methods uh, or a set of techniques that comprise uh, mathematical and rigorous techniques that provide interpretable models and guarantees on the proper execution of systems. So formal methods, they also enable the definition of robust uh, robot controllers. And one of these formalism is uh, temporal logics, which enables to specify desired system behaviors over time. So temporal logics is really a big family and they comprise several formalisms that that can cover discrete or continuous states of the system and discrete or continuous notions of time. And one of them is linear temporal logic, LTL, which considers uh, discrete states of systems and discrete observations of a time. So LTL formulas, they are evaluated on uh, over sequences of states that can be observations of system traces or executions. So, as it is a, a logic, it considers the Boolean, uh, Boolean predicates that can be true or false. And it also considers the, the usual Boolean operators like the conjunction, the disjunction and the, and the negation. And on top of that, it also considers temporal operators that for, given, uh, for a given observation at a given time are evaluated on the future of the sequence. So it's really an interesting formalism that enables one to define patterns of systems such as safety specification, surveillance uh, specifications, reachability, and so on. So for instance, a safety specification could be never hit the table, while a reachability specification could be eventually, at least once in the future, visit that room. So Given an LTI specification, we can say that an execution of the system either violates or satisfies this specification. And also a very interesting tool in formal methods is uh, what is called uh, model checking. So model checking is given a formal specification of the system to prove that any trace generated by the system or any execution of the system will satisfy the property. And it is precisely what brings you the guarantee that your system behaves as intended. So of course, one problem that we had is that we need the specification about the system behavior to be able to do later model checking. So in my talk, I will cover uh, two aspects uh, of social autonomy, namely uh, human preferences and also peer safety. And for each of these two aspects, we will see how we can use formal methods uh, to provide guarantees on their trustworthiness and also preferred uh, human choices. So we will see how learning specifications from data can help to, human model, uh, to model human preferences and also to include notions of perceived safety in techniques such as uh, reinforcement learning. And I will uh, I will cover some words of uh, my close colleagues at the Division of uh, Robotics, Perception and Learning at KTH, and of course, some, uh, some of my own works. So let's start with reinforcement learning and safety considerations uh, of, of reinforcement learning. So I think it's really important to mention reinforcement learning because reinforcement learning is really popular nowadays in robotics, including social acceptance of, of robots. So first of all, let's focus on what reinforcement learning is and, and also what it can achieve. So in the reinforcement learning framework, we consider an agent that has to learn a behavior. And this is done uh, iteratively via interactions with the environment. So usually the, uh, the agent is modeled by a, a markup decision process that comprises a set of states, a, a set of actions the agent can take and the probability that, uh, transition functions that maps the different states the system can be from one state given an action. And also a reward function that is a numerical value on an action taken by the agent and the environment returns that value. So in other words, the agent and the environment, they interact in discrete time steps. And at each step, the agent 
will receive an observation and then chooses an action. And the environment will then move to a state with a given probability and determines a reward that will be forward, forwarded to the uh, learning agent. And the objective in reinforcement learning is for the learning agent to learn an optimal policy that will maximize the, uh, the expectation of the reward. So uh, reinforcement learning is, uh, is, uh, is applied to, uh, to a lot uh, of different tasks in, uh, in robotics, and it is an iterative process, in fact. So the first trials, they will probably fail, but still eventually the learned policy or behavior will, uh, will eventually converge to an optimum where the task is, uh, is completed correctly. So as examples here, uh, reinforcement learning has been applied to, uh, to uh, social uh, navigation, where a robot moves among uh, humans. So for that example in particular, we do not see the iterative learning process, uh, but instead we see the, the last iteration, which is the one that is, uh, that is implemented. So we can see that it is working pretty nicely actually, but it could have been probably better. So here, what we see is that the robot seems safe. So it's, uh, if the robot is near collision with a human, then it will stop. So if there, is, if there was a collision in that case, that would have been probably the human actively colliding with the robot. But about social uh, navigation, uh, we are not really there yet. Here we see many times the robot is hindering the humans in their uh, current trajectories. So sometimes, I don't know if you paid attention, but the people, they had to stop. Uh, and then when the robot uh, had gone, then they could continue. And, uh, and also sometimes the robot is very close to humans, which may be felt uncomfortable or awkward by humans. So reinforcement learning is nice, but in these cases, it doesn't take into account the social, ac uh, the social aspects of navigation. Uh, or the human experience. All right, so reinforcement learning is very nice because it is good at learning an optimal policy that converges to uh, a local maximum of reward. But it is usually bad at guaranteeing safety. So here, imagine the case of parking, where you want to maximize the number of cars you park in the street. So actually, if you do not explicitly specify that the parking is in 2D, but not in 3D, so you cannot pile up the cars, then you may end up with, uh, with interesting solutions. So of course, this example is, uh, is a bit exaggerated, but it pretty much illustrates that we need to include safety considerations and safety constraints in the reinforcement learning loop. And this also holds uh, for social aspects and to some extent trustworthiness. But let's first focus on how to perform safe reinforcement learning. So safe reinforcement learning consists of a set of safety uh, specification and abstraction uh, that you use uh, and also the, engine, the agent's environment that are usually expressed in uh, linear temporal logic. And then given these abstractions, what we do is that we synthesize what is called a shield and that one will enforce at all times the safety properties. And that the agent will always take safe actions and remain in a safe state. So in safe reinforcement learning, the shield will filter out unsafe actions. And to do so, uh, we modify the reinforcement learning loop by either placing the shield before or after the learning agent takes a decision regarding the next action to take. So when the shield is placed before, then uh, the shield will basically remove all the unsafe actions, meaning that the reinforcement learning agent only has to pick up an action among the safe actions. And when we put the shield after the learning agent has chosen an action, then what the shield will do is uh, to monitor the selected action and then to correct the action if and only if the result of the action would place the agent in an unsafe state. So here we see an example of, uh, of safe reinforcement learning, uh, which is about Pac-Man, where, uh, where we see the learn policy by two agents, one uh, which is shielded and the other which is not shielded. 
And what we see from the shielded version is that each time uh, Pac-Man has to take a decision, which is basically uh, either to go left or either to go right or go either to go, uh, to go straight at each uh, intersection, then uh, the shield uh, will restrict the choices Pac-Man uh, can make. So it always remains in a safe state. And here, safe state means that Pac-Man would not uh, be eaten by one of the monsters uh, after the continuation. So now you may be wondering, but what's the link between reinforcement learning, safe reinforcement learning, and perceived safety uh, in human-robot interaction? So now I would like to talk about uh, perceived safety and, um, and, and also uh, I will present some works on how safe reinforcement learning can take into account perceived safety. So in the case of perceived safety, the notion of safety relates to the, the individual's perceived risk. It relates to the subject's assessments of risk. So depending on the technical system, they can be more or less complex, but, but usually they are more difficult to assess than, uh, than objective safety since it is uh, a human-based notion. So usually perceived safety is opposed to objective and normative uh, safety. So objective safety refers to the safety-related history in real-world situations and to what extent all algorithms controlling the autonomous system can ensure uh, safety. And normative safety follows the, the best practices and standards to reduce risk. So it's, it's kind of an engineer's attempt to uh, achieve a safety goal, but whether it worked can only be assessed through objective and perceived safety. So for instance, if we take the risk of collision for an autonomous car, Normative safety would be to add a new sensor system, and the objective safety uh, would be to stop a robot or an autonomous car when an obstacle is measured or, detect or detected below a certain distance. And perceived safety here would be whether a human person would have stopped in front of the car, or if the, uh, the person trusts that the car will stop before collision. So there are a lot of human-related factors affecting uh, perceived safety, such as individual attitudes towards technology, age, gender, previous experiences, cultural backgrounds, uh, the propensity to trust, and so on. And, and, and a good example of culture-related perceived safety, especially in the case of robot navigation in, in, in human-graded environments, are proxemics. So proxemics are the personal space that people maintain uh, around themselves. And this preferred distance has to be taken into account in, uh, in the task of the robot, since uh, the preferred distance people would keep between other people is likely to be the distance uh, they would keep from a robot. And this has to be implemented in the robot's controller. So the distances may also uh, vary based on the, on the robot type, if it's more or less anthropomorphic, machine-like, zoomorphic, and also the perceived safety might, might not only depend on proxemics after all, but also on other factors such as perhaps the speed uh, at which the robot is approaching a human, time delays, and so on. Okay, and now maybe you, be, you may be wondering, but how can we measure perceived safety? So usually, perceived safety measures uh, they comprise uh, explicit measures depicting the, the conscience uh, and the conscious impressions that people can reflect on. So this can be retrieved through, uh, through user studies, a questionnaire asking to rate a user experience or a scale, uh, or interviews asking why the person felt safe in, uh, in a particular case or also more implicit measures referring to uh, unconscious attitudes, such as time to answer or behavior while uh, rating the, the system, like facial expressions, for instance. And all this is done uh, through user studies. So focusing on the social interactions between humans and robots, 
uh, we conducted online experiments where, uh, where participants uh, had to walk towards uh, a virtual uh, robot. So the, um, the simulation was a, a simplified version of the, of the game of chicken. Uh, perhaps you have seen this, uh, this movie of the 50s with uh, James Dean in uh, Rebel Without a Cause, I think it was the name of the movie. And, um, and in, um, in the classic game theory formulation of the, of the game of chicken, there are two drivers, A and B, that drive uh, towards each other on a, collide, on a collision course. So one must swerve or they will crash. But if one driver swerves and the other doesn't, then the one who swerves is called uh, the chicken. And that's bad for his reputation. And the preferred outcome for A is just for B to swerve, thus ensuring that A survives and keeps its face. And the preferred outcome for B is for A to swerve. That's the other way around. So in this study, what we, uh, we focused on was the, the impact on perceived autonomy and safety on the human decision on whether to swerve or continue straight. So the user, they had to face different robots that differed in, uh, that differed in terms of uh, anthropomorphism. There was an Ardu uh, robot and uh, a Sophia robot uh, that have uh, obviously different levels of embodiment. And uh, what we found was that uh, people tend uh, to swerve closer to the more human-like robot and to the robot thought to be teleoperated, that is, uh, the one that had a low level of anthropomorphism. And after establishing that human robot preferred distances uh, are influenced by the robot's embodiment and whether the user thinks the robot is autonomous, I mean, what we are currently doing is, uh, is to manipulate uh, the human and robot uh, internal states and goals. So for instance, if the robot uh, or the human, uh, they are in a hurry or, or carrying something for child. Uh, I mean, this kind of motivations, we want to see what is the, the impact of the, on, the, on the behavior. We want to see if people would sacrifice being on time in order to give way to a robot that has been called to assist in, in an emergency. So what is important to mention here is that given all this information, our goal now is to design novel robot trajectories that can anticipate uh, the human need for safety and comfort. So we want to take the preferred swerving distance in real world robot controllers and later measure the impact of human users experience. And in the end, what we want is to, uh, to measure the improvement of, uh, of trust in, in human-robot interaction. And now I would like to talk about uh, reinforcement learning and perceived safety. And I will advertise the work uh, colleagues did recently. So they use uh, shield synthesis uh, for perceived safety. And here they integrate in the reinforcement learning framework. Uh, the perceived safety aspect. So as you know, with, uh, with formal methods, we can design formal specifications of system. And then from a specification, we can generate a shield that will filter out unsafe actions the agent might take in the reinforcement learning framework. So here, what we want instead is to synthesize shields that do not take into account the specification the designer of the system made, but the perceived safety instead. And to do so, uh, the reinforcement learning loop is changed so that in the end, the reinforcement learning framework contains two loops. So the first loop, which is, uh, which is the, uh, the, uh, the inner loop here, is basically the classical reinforcement learning loop that will take the advantage of the self-play by, by sampling from a distribution of shields of, of human feedback. And to do so, the uh, then given a distribution of possible shields, policies are trained until convergence is observed. And later, those policies, they are used to generate trajectories or behaviors that will be evaluated by humans. And these are these generated trajectories that are forwarded to the outer loop where human feedback will evaluate the example trajectories already generated. And here the humans evaluate the trajectories 
based on their PFC safety. And then the human feedback is mapped into some scale form, and then it is forwarded to the inner loop again to refine the policy and then to convert towards a policy that takes into account the perceived safety. And, uh, and in the end, the learn policy reflects behavior or trajectories that are perceived safe, uh, that are perceived safe uh, by humans. And uh, in, uh, yeah, in these experiments, then, um, then they, uh, they, uh, they simulated uh, a social navigation task among humans. So this, uh, this video on the left is, uh, is the non-shielded uh, version, not taking into account uh, perceived safety. And as you see, the robot is, uh, is moving very close to humans. And uh, whereas in this, uh, in this video on the right, it is uh, the shielded uh, version with perceived safety. And then we see that the, uh, the, the robot is taking more time and waits until, uh, until uh, humans are far away enough uh, in order to, uh, to pass. All right, so previously I talked about safe reinforcement learning, which you can achieve using a specification on, uh, on the system safety. But sometimes it might be the case that you do not have a proper specification of the system's behavior, or maybe you suspect that the specification is, is not rich enough. And, and, and that's something that, that happens nowadays because now the systems are more and more complicated and designing a specification by hand may be challenging. So one problem at hand now is to learn these specifications directly from data, that is existing observed runs of the system or robust trajectories or behavior. Right, so previously we saw uh, one type of temporal logic, which was uh, linear temporal logic. And here I would just like to highlight a specific temporal logic formalism, which is called signal temporal logic. So signal temporal logic, also STL, uh, is defined on uh, continuous signals and can be used uh, for specifications uh, of systems. And it can express system properties that include time bounds and bounds on physical system parameters. So we say that it is uh, continuous space and continuous time. And one of its advantages compared to STL is its richness to specify continuous time systems. So to do so, the temporal operators, uh, they are equipped with time intervals. And in the case of robotics, it's, uh, it's really an attractive formalism to model uh, classes of desired robot motion or specifications of trajectories. So in fact, here you can see the trajectory of a robot as a multi-dimensional signal over time that are the position on the X and the Y dimensions of the robot over time. And it is used uh, to define spatial preferences uh, of robot trajectories. So here, for instance, we have, uh, we have a specification uh, that, uh, that says that between a given time interval, uh, the robot uh, should visit uh, this zone. Uh, and then for another time interval, uh, then the robot should visit that zone, always making, making sure that the robot avoids uh, this red zone. So STL is, uh, is really powerful formalism for robot motion planning and, uh, and the definition of, of spatial and time preferences and constraints. And typically the system properties expressed through LTL or STL that are designed based on domain or task knowledge. But whenever there, there does not already exist a formal representation of the behavior of the systems, then the completion of uh, motion planning or the calculation, the calculation of safety guarantees is not possible anymore. But a common characteristic of, uh, of the systems today is that uh, they embed a lot of sensors and they generate a lot of data. So we may indeed have records or runs of autonomous systems describing the behavior of the system. So temporal logic inference methods, they aim at 
synthesizing behavior descriptions from system data. And this is extremely useful because once you have generated such a specification, then later you can use it for control purposes or provide guarantees on the proper execution of the system. So what is the interest of temporal logic inference? Well, basically it's to learn specification of systems given existing observed executions of the system. And it is applied in many contexts like, uh, like cyber physical systems in general and, and, and then uh, robotics. So for instance, in the case of autonomous cars, you may want to identify specifications of trajectories when an obstacle is blocking the road and when the car has to drive into oncoming traffic. And then if you have good examples and other suboptimal examples, then um, uh, of like, for instance, uh, trajectories that make uh, huge detours around the obstacle, then, then you can learn a policy to avoid the obstacles, the, the obstacle correctly and efficiently. And another example is to identify different driving styles from data. So what you want here is to perform a sort of clustering of the trajectories and then extract one specification for each cluster and, and later implement in the core, in the course controller, the, the driving styles that, that are the most socially acceptable and perceived as safe. So you could also imagine performing this in, in, in applications with robots moving among humans uh, and let human users rate their experience regarding sets of trajectories taken by the robot and, and learn, for instance, from our specifications of, of proxemics. Okay, so in the rest of my talk, uh, I will focus on the inference of signal topologic formula. So one of the techniques to learn an STL formula from data is to create a decision tree supporting the structure of the STL formula. So it presumes that you have uh, positive and negative data. So in other words, executions of the system that are known to satisfy the specification or to violate the specification. So the decision trees, you know, they are pretty much straightforward. At each node of a tree, a decision is made to, uh, to separate them, the data locally. And then the list of the tree, they indicate the class of each uh, instance to classify. So in the case of STL formulas, we want to retrieve a tree and each node of the tree, in fact, will be a, a simple STL formula. We also call it a, a primitive that is composed of predicates surrounded by a temporal operator. And the learning is as follows. So it's a recursive process where the goal is to find appropriate nodes of the tree. That is to find uh, the best STL formula that will split the set of executions in the data set. And when the, the, the learning uh, process has terminated, we can translate the decision tree into an STL formula. And to do this is pretty straightforward. We return the disjunction of all paths uh, leading to a true leaf. So all this presumes that you have a bunch of executions that you have recorded. But, uh, but sometimes you, uh, you may have few data or you want a feedback of users who know the system to assess whether the learning process is going towards uh, the right direction or not. So considering that case, uh, a method that, uh, that we developed lately is about active learning of specification. So in this active learning approach, the learning algorithm that tries to guess what is the STL formula will generate an execution of the system according to its actual guess of the specification. It can be the trajectory of a robot, for instance. And it will forward the trajectory to a teacher, which is basically either the system from which you, you want to learn the specification, but that can also be any oracle that can play the role of assessor or evaluator of the trajectory. So it's an iterative process where the learning algorithm will, will send these queries to the teacher and then will retrieve a label, either satisfying or violating to uh, the generated trajectory. And from that, we can refine, uh, we can refine the guess of the, uh, of, the, of the specification to learn. And this, um, uh, yeah, also at some point, uh, the, uh, the learning algorithm can, can also ask the teacher, oh, is my hypothesis 
equivalent to the target specification. And then the teacher can say yes or no. And then depending on that, the refinement process continues or, or the learned STL formula is returned. So something to mention here is that actually, uh, I mean, that was the, the main motivation for that work is that we can use this algorithm in a human robot interaction setting to mine social requirements of autonomous system. So imagine a user study with crowd workers who have to evaluate how good or bad is the behavior of a robot. And where the notion of goodness is linked to the satisfaction or violation of a social specification of the robot. Well, the crowd workers here, they act as the oracle, as the teacher labeling the human robot interaction. So that's very interesting because uh, then depending on how you present the generated trajectories and what questions you ask, you can ask what is the perceived safety of the users to retrieve a specification of the perceived safety of the system. So we hope then to figure out good specifications of what socially acceptable system is and, uh, and then implement uh, the learned specification in, uh, in a robust controller. So now if you uh, remember the, the chicken experiment where a human was, uh, was running on a colliding course with a robot. Well, uh, here we are now interested in learning a specification out of it. So however, you know, people in that situation, they may have different behaviors to avoid the robot. How exactly would you avoid a robot? So would you slow down when approaching the robot? And then would you swerve to the left or to the right? Or would you accelerate to intimidate the robot? So here, what we want to see uh, and also what, what we can observe is that the classical definition of, uh, of signal tempo logic is maybe a bit too rigid. And what we want here, in fact, is to model, uh, is to model stochastic properties of human behavior and enforce probabilistic guarantees on them. So STL, the classical STL is a bit too rigid for that, but luckily there are uh, probabilistic extensions of STN that consider probabilistic predicates. And in this work, uh, what we did was to learn probabilistic uh, STL specifications uh, to model human trajectories. So it's a good compromise between the rigor and the interpretability of, of temporal logics and the essence of human behavior, which, which in the end can be, can be hard to predict at all times. So we collected data in a study where users in a simulated environment had to navigate a space with the robot. And then the crowd workers, they could control the, the, their avatar uh, uh, according to speed or to direction. And we demonstrated that, uh, that STL with the probabilistic predicates was really a suitable formalism for uh, modeling human behavior in the context of, of social navigation. And, um, and then uh, the land specification can be later implemented in socially aware robot controllers to improve the quality of human experience in, uh, in human robot encounters. And, uh, and then uh, using uh, data from the, from, the, from the user study, we could, we could learn uh, a specification that basically was saying that at the beginning, we start in that zone, then we pursue in that zone. And then at some point, we might uh, swerve to the left or to the right to finally reach the, uh, the target uh, goal that was behind the robot. So one of the challenges now is to implement the LAN uh, specification in the controllers, and then to ask the same participants to evaluate how good are the generated uh, trajectories. So we can, in a sense, close the loop. All right, so now the last topic I would like to, uh, to cover is how to model human preferences in human robot, uh, in robot navigation. So here, this is quite interesting because usually STL has some parameters that we can tune, spatial and temporal. And in this part of my talk, we will see uh, how we can adjust the specifications parameters depending on human preferences retrieved uh, through user, user studies. So here I would like to highlight one uh, recent papers of two colleagues, Carson and Van Vavren, uh, on encoding human driving styles in motion planning for autonomous cars. 
So driving styles are absolutely crucial uh, for passenger, uh, passenger trust and, uh, and also acceptance of autonomous vehicles. And it's also very important for other road users, such as other drivers and pedestrians. So driving styles, they can be learned from data. However, there are some studies that show that people tend to prefer more defensive driving styles for autonomous vehicles than their own driving styles. But designing the controllers of autonomous cars to drive too defensively, in fact, it leads to two problems. Some inefficiency, because then if the autonomous car is too defensive, then it, might, uh, it may drive uh, outrageously slow and then create uh, some traffic jams. And also somehow compromising the passenger comfort. So in this work, uh, they encoded human driving styles in the motion plane for autonomous vehicles by refining signal topologic specifications with user input. And to do so, they encoded, they encoded uh, driving styles using STL formulas. So they encoded uh, six uh, different traffic rules. Uh, the first one that was safe, uh, the safe long longitudinal distance, which is a rule recommending uh, that the uh, that the time uh, to precede a car should not be smaller than two, three seconds. Uh, a safe lateral distance, which corresponds to the minimum distance in which it is possible for a driver to, uh, to react in case of unforeseen uh, lane changing. Then uh, the third rule, which is the safe overtaking maneuver. That is that uh, no overtaking uh, is attempted unless really needed. And, that the overtaking maneuver is performed uh, on the left of the uh, vehicle uh, to overtake. And then maintaining the speed limit, uh, the safety distance uh, to static obstacles, and, and maintaining the center line. And what is very interesting is that here they implemented a motion planner using these rules. And the way the rules are, in, interpreted, uh, are interpreted by the controller uh, could be calibrated to encode different driving behaviors, aggressive, neutral, or defensive. And, uh, and from, from that, uh, an objective defensive score uh, could be computed. And later, in, a, uh, in an online study, people evaluated the perceived level of defensiveness for the different driving styles. And they could show that different levels of calibrations of these STL formulas resulted in different driving behaviors that are perceived as distinct driving styles. And what they could see is that people present or prefer um, different generated driving styles, which, which often correlates to their own driving style. So in conclusion about that work is that the, the calibration of STL rules allows to model different human driving styles in motion planning. And this pays the way to the deployment of autonomous vehicles where the perceived safety and trust are improved. And of course, this can be applied to all kinds of, of robots in, in human crowded environments. All right, so I'm now approaching the, the end of my talk. So uh, as concluding remarks, uh, I presented, uh, I talked about two aspects of uh, social autonomy, which are the human preferences and also perceived safety and how we can improve perceived safety in robotic applications of reinforcement learning. And I've also shown how we can use the inference of temporal logic specifications to depict human preferences. And how we can use perceived safety to, uh, to refine uh, controllers based on human preferences. Okay, so now the remaining challenges, however, are the one related uh, to closing the loop. So we saw that we can learn models from data that account for perceived safety and user preferences. But what we want now is to implement robot controllers based on our models of perceived safety and user preferences. And what we want next is to present the robots uh, in front of the people and see what are their reactions. Is the robot socially behaving as expecting with our formal specification, or do we have to refine our specification again and again to make the robots 
more and more social. And of course, our ambition here is to end up with interpretable, understandable, and accountable models that stand for robust satisfaction and robust specifications of perceived safety and trustworthiness in, in human robot interaction. I mean, how can you trust a robot if you cannot trust the models uh, and the algorithms that drive it? So my last claim for today is that uh, for human robot interaction to be trustworthy, we need models and algorithms uh, we can trust. And that's correct by design social autonomy. And, and I'm really convinced that this is the future of robotics. All right, so before I return the floor to uh, digital futures, I would like to thank all the great people I had the chance to work with. So the project leaders, uh, Jana Tumova and Yolanda Leite, uh, my project fellow, uh, Ilaria Torre, uh, the project lead, um, all the people in the division um, I work with uh, in one way or another, brainstorming sessions, and, and also the, uh, the people who, uh, who inspired my talk today. So Christian Peck, Daniel Marta, Sander van Waren, uh, Jasper Carlson, and, and also many more. Uh, so uh, thanks for your attention and, uh, and I'm now open to questions. <laughs>